Christ, the elect one, the one who is preexistent, he's the elect one, and you're only chosen insofar as you're in him. Leighton and I agree on a couple of things. You all know Leighton. Uh, if you have not, go over to his channel, Soteriology 101. And uh, Leighton, uh, if there's anyone that has an argument to refute Calvinism, uh, it's going to be Leighton. Now, there are there are at least two things that I agree on, on, on Leighton. I do not believe that people are so depraved so as to not be able to make a decision, uh, an, an affirmative decision for Christ, and also do not believe hold to limited atonement. Now, there are some Calvinists that say, well, it's impossible for you to hold to election, but not the others. And, I'll, and I've, I've tried to demonstrate why I believe so. But and these are the areas that I disagree with late on. I do hold to uh, election. Uh, and so that is what we're going to talk about today. Election and predestination. We just kind of lump them together because uh, for all intents and purposes, they, they, they go hand in hand. They are twin cousins, so to speak. And so. Uh, what we decided to do was I'll just kind of say what I think, what I feel, and then it'll kind of be a counter point, counterpoint. Uh, we have not discussed how we're going to do this. We're just going to just kind of play off each other, what we agree with, what we disagree with, why, and so forth, and we'll go to the scripture. So uh, what, I, uh, what I believe, Leighton, like you, I believe that man has the ability to make a positive decision. But what I do also believe, though, that 4,000 years of history prior to Christ's coming is that we have demonstrated, and I include myself because if I were there, I'd do the same thing. We have demonstrated that if we do not have God um, doing something, either inwardly or outwardly, we are not going to keep striving, keep riding with God. And so therefore, I think the invitation is made, and I agree, I don't think God would offer an invitation that he knows full well that we cannot um, or will not want to, um, at least at least uh, momentarily. I believe that we can at least momentarily make a positive decision. Uh, the issue is being consistent uh, with that decision. And so for me, I think that something has to be done. Now, this is where I also might break work with some people who are who believe in election, who believes that regeneration might precede faith. Uh, I'm open to it. I think that it probably does precede faith. Uh, that is saving faith. Uh, but I'm also open to it uh, coming after. Um, however, I think the decision to regenerate someone uh, is done prior to the person's uh, making that decision. And I'll, I'll probably explain that because it might sound confusing. I'll flesh that out a little bit later. But I hold to the belief that uh, we can um, place our faith in God. We can follow God. We just won't or at least won't do it consistently. And so therefore, God does a work in us. And I think that his decision to do so is prior to the foundation. So we'll, we'll, I guess we'll go ahead and jump into uh, Ephesians 1. And guys, y'all let me know if the font is big enough. There's an issue with my fonts. I've got, I'm in the same NASB. Um, and <laughs> like you're the reason why uh, I'm using the NASB, by the way, uh, because when I use ESV, there are people <laughs> who call it the uh, uh, <laughs> the reformed uh, uh, scripture. Like, or the like sovereign, yeah, like sovereign version. Yeah, yeah so... <laughs> NASB and funny, and funny enough, I actually have the I have, have the uh, ESV up just because I, I always use the ESV when I when I uh -huh. when I can just because I know that a lot of my Calvinistic friends uh, like it better, and that way they can't use that as a reason for dismissing my arguments. So I, I'll often use the ESV for that reason, if nothing else. Yeah, so I I will um, um, use the NASB because it's get it's got the least amount of pushback. It's not a version you can that you can <laughs> use and somebody won't say anything about. But anyway, uh, uh, starting off, let's go to Ephesians one one, and here is where I guess we can jump off and let's go ahead and and start it off. Um, verse one, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. By the way, guys, let me know in in the chats if 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 the font is big enough for you guys. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are fruitful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse three, and here it is. We go ahead and jump into it right now. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings uh, in the heavenly places or in the heavenlies in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Now, I'm like uh, other people that you would disagree with. Um, I see this as God uh, electing people, choosing people 
prior to the foundation of the world. And I know that your view is that um, what is chosen, what is elected, uh, is is being in Christ. And so the issue is going to come down to uh, are we chosen? Does he choose us who are in Christ or does he choose us to be in Christ? And so my take is he chooses us to be in Christ. Well, and I, I would just say it, it does say that he chose us in Christ. It doesn't say he chose us to be in Christ. And so what? Where where's our location when we're chosen? And in, in my view, we're in Christ when we're chosen. So mm-hmm. he's, he's speaking to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And so those who have faith in Christ Jesus are in Christ through faith, just like verse 13 goes on to say down a little bit lower, where it says, when you believed, you were marked mm-hmm. in Christ. So you're not marked in Christ before the foundation of the world. You're marked in Christ when you hear the gospel and you believe. And so you're chosen in Christ under his headship. So you're under Adam from birth. But when you believe, after hearing the word of God, you're marked in Christ. And those who are in Christ are chosen to be made holy and blameless. Now, this is a decision God made before the foundation of the world, that whether you're Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, regardless of your nationality, regardless of your morality, God has chosen before the foundation of the world. This has always been his plan. That's not just for the Jewish nation. It's always been God's plan that if you're in Christ through faith, that he will make you holy and blameless. All these spiritual blessings have been destined before the foundation of the world for those who are in Christ. But it's your responsibility to put your faith in Christ. It's not something that God is going to effectually cause you to do through some irresistible work of grace. I don't believe that's a a biblical concept whatsoever. So when I look at and I'll come back to verse three, but when I look at verse 13 in terms of being in Christ, he uses these, these participles to kind of describe. Uh, and so to me, I don't I don't see just by the grammar that is stating that it is a it one causes the other. It's just descriptive of that. You having having believed and having um, ha- have, having heard and having believed. And I think it's a reason why he's using the participle for for believing and, and hearing. But the reason why going back to verse three um just like, and, and I think this is one of the few cases, not one of the few cases, but one of the many cases, one of the, the uh, uh, great examples of how the English grammar rules set up perfectly with the Greek grammar rules. And so uh, when he says that he chose us, the, the, the direct object um, of what he chose, and then the, the word for chose is in the uh, aorist middle, which means he does so for, for himself. So the Lord chooses for himself, but chooses what? Uh, and he says it, the, the direct object would be us. So he chose us like like John. Who's us? Ball. I'm sorry. Who is us? Us, who, who whoever is in Christ. But the issue is, is he choosing us right. who happens to be in Christ or choosing us to be in Christ? And so that is therein lies the issue. I don't think that he chose because for me to say, think that it's a corporate election to where he is choosing those who happen to be in Christ. Um the problem would be and rather than using the word hamas which is us he would just simply use other word or words that he's used in other passages to state whomever which would be pas or pan so he didn't say uh he chose whomever is in christ or all that is in christ he specifically spoke about us and so even though and i've heard you mention this before that though we were non-existent uh even to even for him to choose christ still refers to us that were still non-existent because he does, he's not choosing Christ um, to be our savior to people who are non-existent. He already has in mind, he's got Bob, he's got Frank, he's got Mary in mind before they are even knowing what they're going to do. And so grammatically speaking, I just, I just see this, he chose the direct object, he chose us. Uh, and so the us that he chose, it makes it to, to me pretty clear what he chose was who's, us. But who's, but who's the audience according to verse one? Believers the or, faithful, or, the, or believers, supposed believers. The faithful in Christ. Uh-huh. So us refers to believers in Christ. So he chose believers in Christ to be made holy and blameless. When did mm-hmm. he make this choice? Before the foundation of the world. It doesn't say anything about him choosing arbitrarily certain individuals before they're ever born to be believers. It just says he's chosen us, the people who are believers in Christ, to be made holy and blameless. It doesn't, it doesn't ever say he chose for us to become believers through some irresistible or effectual work of grace. So when he says, so when he says or when he choose, what did I just do? Oh, so when he chooses us to be in Christ or chooses those of us who are in Christ. So before the foundation of the earth, he chooses whomever is going to be in Christ to be saved. Right. So uh, my question is this, though. One, why not use as he's always used pos or pond like you would see in John three sixteen or 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 other places? 
but why would when he's choosing those people that are in Christ, does he not know, does not have in mind a thought of who these people are going to be? Well, because he's speaking to a, a Christian audience. He's speaking to those who have faith in Christ. So when he says he's chosen us, the faithful in Christ, to be made holy and blameless, he doesn't need to specify that through some grammatical you know, nuance. He's, he's speaking to a specific audience, those who have faith in Christ. I think it's the, it's the more, more Calvinistic leaning or reformed leaning kind of interpretation that brings in that, that westernized thought of each individual, Bob, Mary, Sue, like you were mentioning earlier, we tend to think as Westerners in very individualistic terms, whereas the first century Jew would have been thinking in more corporate terms because they have federal heads like you're in Adam or you're in Christ. And so Christ, the elect one, the one who is preexistent, he's the elect one and you're only chosen insofar as you're in him. And so if you're in Christ, you are elect in the Son. You are elect in Christ. And that's more of the West, uh, The westernized version is more of, no, he chose Corey before the foundation of the world to be in Christ by making Corey into a believer through some effectual work of grace. And I, I just think that's a westernized, you know, uh, more Calvinistic interpretation. And I don't, I don't think that's what Paul had in mind at all. And again, we'll just agree to disagree on that, obviously, mm -hmm. and still be friendly about it. But at the same time, I just, I don't, I don't see any support grammatically or otherwise. And, and I don't think you need to know Greek to see the, the distinctions between that. In other words, um, there, there's nothing within the, the nuance of the original language that supports one of those readings over the other, as far as I can tell. That there, therein lies the issue, and let me just say this also, um, because there are going to be those folks who, and I don't want us to be tribalistic, meaning that there are some who are um, as Calvinistic as they come. There are some who are anti-Calvinist, and those who are in between those who who, who subscribe to one view or the other. Um, all we're doing is is saying we're trying to figure out how or what brought us to saving faith. Not what, not what saves us. In other words, so we, we all here believe that you must place your faith in Christ. The reason why I want to put that out, because inevitably somebody's going to come in and say that this person is of the devil or this is a doctrine of demons. All we're, we're not, <laughs> we're not eliminating yeah. that you must place your faith in Christ. Uh, so you must place your faith in Christ. We're just kind of going, uh, lifting up the hood and seeing, well, this is how this works. So I just want to put that out right, there. But now right. to, in well, order, and I'm sorry, go ahead. I would just add to that and say, yeah, we I, I totally agree with you on that. And a lot of things, even you said in the beginning about how God has to do something first, I was amening that. I was agreeing. Yes, God, God, God's the initiator. We are responders. God works first. And so there's a lot of overlap even in what we're saying, though we may differ in what we're understanding with regard to in Christ and being chosen. Um, but but here's a, just a real quick analogy that kind of helped at least some people that I've explained my view of predestination election to. And, you know, I've put it this way. If, you know, here in our city, there was a storm coming and, and God put in the middle of the city a fortress and said, anyone who gets into the fortress will survive the storm. But anyone who stays outside the fortress will surely perish. So he is predestined. He is destined beforehand. What will happen to anyone in the fortress? And before the storms even coming before you could even say before these people even lived, you could say God destined that whoever's in that fortress will live. Whoever's outside that fortress will surely die. Sure enough, the storm comes. Everyone who got in the fortress lived. Everyone who stayed outside the fortress died. You could say, therefore, everyone inside the fortress was predestined to live and everyone outside the fortress was predestined, destined beforehand to die. But it says nothing about God predetermining who would choose to get into the fortress or who would choose to rebel and stay outside the fortress. That's their responsibility. So you can have a doctrine of predestination that God has destined beforehand what will happen to those who are in Christ in the fortress. Just like you, you, you can say those who are outside the fortress were predestined to perish. Um, and so there is a predestination, even from an Arminian or a provisionist perspective like myself. And so a lot of Calvinists get the idea, and I'm not blaming you for this by any means, but some people get the idea that only Calvinists hold to the doctrine of predestination and election. And we're saying, no, no, we, we also hold to 
a very robust doctrine of predestination and election. We just don't remove human responsibility in the process. You're responsible to get into Christ. You're responsible to put your faith in him. You're responsible to get in the fortress. If you don't do that, it's not because God didn't really want you or because God didn't cause you to do it through some irresistible work of grace. He didn't elect you. You were chosen unwanted by your, your, your maker. Um, you, I mean, you were born unwanted by your maker. God created you for destruction and all those kinds of necessary consequences of a more Calvinistic reading. Instead, it, it maintains human responsibility. You're responsible to get into Christ, the elect one. If you don't and you perish, that's your fault and you have no one to blame but yourself.